There must be 30 dead scientists in the past month. Christ, another countdown. The official trailer for Three Body Problem is here. And if you're not familiar, this is Netflix's attempt to bring an epic sci-fi series to the small screen that would have been considered unfilmable 15 years ago. Part of the reason this show even exists is because of the success of Game of Thrones, another genre title that would have been considered unmakeable right up until the moment when David Benioff and Dan Weiss started making it. Famously, that series' ending left a sour taste in many of the millions of people who watched its mouths. But no matter how you feel about that, you'd have to concede that the show was like nothing else that came before it. It was ambitious and operated on a scale that just wasn't what you expected from TV at the time. And while times have changed, and we're talking about sci-fi here instead of fantasy, these two projects have a lot in common. The thing that sets this new venture apart is the remembrance of Earth's past trilogy they're adapting is already complete. The first book in the series debuted in China in 2008 where it became insanely popular and was translated into English a few years later to go on to win a Hugo Award and become a New York Times bestseller. Depending on when you picked up your copy, you might even have a blurb from George R. R. Martin on the cover, if it doesn't have the one from former U.S. President Barack Obama on it. In some corners, Sishin Lu's book series is a huge deal. And that makes describing what it's about tricky because millions of people have read the series. They know what it's about. Then you have the official press from Netflix, which preserves most of the big mysteries, while other articles are more forthcoming. I'm going to base the majority of this video on the most spoiler-free info that's out there. But at the end, I'll do a short section that references a big article that Hollywood Reporter put out that provides some interesting details that might be of interest even if you haven't read the series and don't want to know how it ends. I'll give a quick spoiler warning before I get into that, though, just in case. There's a point in this new trailer when two characters are looking up at the sky, and what they see is recognizable to diehard fans of the book series like myself, but also doesn't immediately seem like it belongs there. It's familiar, but not exactly what you might expect. What we hear in the voiceover is incredibly important, though. They are coming, and there's nothing you can do to stop them. This gets at what I think is the best thing about the book series, and what was certainly the hook for me beyond another detail that pops up later in the trailer. And that's why I was a little bit let down about the previous clip they released. It wasn't so much the obvious changes to the story, because I'm in favor of making changes when you adapt a book into a different format, but the tone of that clip just wasn't what I was expecting. I like John Bradley, and his character isn't a direct adaptation of someone who exists in the book, so whatever. Make him the kind of character your story needs him to be. But on its own, the teaser just didn't feel like a great representation of where the book The Three-Body Problem can take you. So I decided not to make a video about that, and wait until something more substantial came out, and that turned out to be the right decision because this trailer is exactly what I was hoping to see. It opens with a character played by Benedict Wong, a detective named Da Xie, walking down a spooky hallway. In voiceover, he says, that must be 30 dead scientists in the past month. And as he walks into a room where there are numbers frantically scrawled on the wall, he adds, Christ, another countdown. When these numbers first showed up in the book was when I fully got sucked into the story. And we see another instance of them when we meet a brand new character in the next scene. Augie Salazar, played by Aiza Gonzalez, is riding on a train and this countdown is shown up in her field of vision. You see that when she looks up at the ceiling, it's there, and then when she looks at another passenger, it's just sort of pasted right over them. In her character description, Augie is described as a nanotech trailblazer, which would line up with the character that dealt with this countdown in the book. But this situation mostly played out as an internal struggle inside his head. That's not the easiest thing to show in a visual medium. So what it looks like they're doing is they're splitting this character into several, and they'll have this affect them separately so that they can come together to discuss it with each other and fill the audience in on the details that way. 
In the press materials, they refer to these characters as the Oxford Five, which comes up in the series description. That reads, the story begins in 1960s China when a young woman makes a fateful decision that reverberates across space and time into the present day. When the laws of nature inexplicably unravel, a tight-knit group of brilliant scientists must join forces with an unflinching detective to stop humanity's greatest threat. Three-Body Problem is an epic story that redefines sci-fi drama with its layered mysteries and story of human connection. Just to get this out of the way up front, it's clear that there are a lot of changes from the book series. Some of those I think are necessary in service of making a good TV show, while others appear to be an attempt to give the story a more international focus. I'll always think of this as a story centered with the Chinese point of view, because that's how I first experienced it. It was written by a Chinese author, and for me at least, that was part of its appeal, because I had never read any Chinese sci-fi before that. The show appears to start there, but then it shifts its focus to London, which could work, because it becomes international and involves all of humanity. But I do hope that they're able to reflect some of how that POV shaped the way the story develops. In this trailer, there are only a few shots that take place in 1960s China, but the first teaser trailer they put out had a lot more, and I talked about those in my first trailer breakdown. We also see the primary character from that part of the story now that she's grown older. There isn't a lot of context in the current day shot she's in, but it does seem like she's probably in London since all the other characters are there. After Augie has her encounter with the countdown, she talks to Da Xie, saying what happened to them. It cuts back to the countdown on the wall that looks like it's written in blood, and he says someone or something is targeting scientists. This is also related to the line in the description that says when the laws of nature inexplicably unravel. And we see a shot of a scientist who appears to have drowned himself in his bathtub. Later, a different character named Vera Ye says, Do you believe in God? Before she kills herself by taking a swan dive in a massive neutrino detector. Then there's another shot I can't really make sense of where several people are hanging from light posts with Big Ben in the background. The suicides and or deaths are what Dasha is investigating and what appears to bring everyone together at the beginning of the current day story. Dasha is based on a book character whom he seems to have a lot in common with, but as mentioned, he appears to be working in London. The other thing the show looks like it's doing is pulling characters forward from all three books so that they appear in the first season. This makes sense to provide some character continuity between the seasons. And the most obvious example of this is Thomas Wade, who isn't introduced until the final book of the series. As a common era man, he was around when the events of the first book were happening. So I think it makes sense to get him involved earlier. He's played by the great Liam Cunningham, which many people will already be familiar with from his role on Game of Thrones, and introducing him now should give viewers time to invest in the character, which will pay off down the road. He's just referred to as Wade in the show's promo materials, and he's all over this trailer. His character description reads, The charismatic leader of the world's most elite intelligence operation. Wade is the ultimate big picture thinker. People are props in his game, and his audacious gambits have a tendency to pay off. We hear him say they're going after our best and brightest, and that cuts to a cork board with pictures of the Oxford Five on it. I'll discuss them all individually, but in this shot there are post-it notes by John Bradley's character saying that he was an Oxford dropout, and Will Downing saying he has a background in theoretical physics. Wade continues, there's someone behind everything, you just have to dig. From that it's clear he'll play an active role in the main events of this season. And he shares some scenes with the character named Jin. Chang, played by Jess Hong. She's another member of the Oxford Five, and this is where things get a little more complicated. This character also seems to be based on a book three character named Chung Xin. Like Wade, she has a central role there, but despite being from the common era, she wasn't involved with much that's happening that's recognizable in this trailer. In the first teaser, we saw her put on the gaming headset that she discussed with John Bradley's character in the sneak peek clip. Her character description reads, A genius theoretical physicist with an insatiable thirst for answers about the biggest questions in the universe. Jin's curiosity could be her biggest strength if it's not her downfall. 
A lot of her shots involve the headset, which is the biggest mystery the trailer introduces besides the dying scientists. And Netflix used this otherworldly looking gizmo to promote the show at the annual consumer tech trade show CES in Las Vegas. The first two teasers establish this is a portal to a VR game that is indistinguishable from reality. We see a little more of that here, although not much that is completely new. There are more shots from one of my favorite things that happened in the first book, and a better shot of the burning horse, a neat looking shot of Jess Hong and John Bradley where it looks like they're about to float away, and a really intriguing one of her and Liam Cunningham that I mentioned at the beginning, where they're looking up at the sky and see a giant ring. I won't elaborate any further on what that is because like a lot of things in this video, I'm pretty sure what they're looking at from the books, but it would be a spoiler if you haven't read them. Anyway, the headset is also from the character story I mentioned Augie Salazar is based on, and so it shows how the Oxford Five will all be connected. There's also a shot with Wade and Jin on a rooftop that includes Raj Varma, who's played by Samer Usmani. He doesn't factor heavily in this trailer, but he did appear in the first one standing next to a naval vessel. And his character description reads, A naval officer from a military family, Raj has a deep commitment to his work. His relationship with his girlfriend Jin risks becoming collateral damage in his mission. For people who've read the books, I figured this character is based on Zhang Beihai, so I was surprised to see that Chang Jin was his girlfriend. For everyone else, that's a character that plays a major role in the second book and may turn out to be more connected to the other main characters in the show than I was expecting. Jin also shares some scenes with Saul Duran, who's played by Giovanna Depo. His character description reads, A member of the Oxford Five, no less gifted but far less focused than his peers. Saul is a physics research assistant who hasn't reached his full potential. When the ultimate challenge presents itself, will he rise to it? To me, that sounds like my favorite character from the series, Luoji, since he doesn't show up until he becomes the main character of the second book and remains important throughout. I wasn't expecting him to show up this season. After realizing that all of these other characters map out to someone from the novels, I'm starting to think this is probably him and don't have another idea that even makes sense. This is a little harder to swallow than Wong, who was also Chinese, but he wasn't that developed as a character. We spend a lot of time with Luoji, and he'll always just kind of be a Chinese man in my head. But one thing I will say is that Jovan Adepo was really good in The Leftovers and Watchmen. So if they did decide to use him for this role, the acting should be top notch. To loop back around to the voiceover, after Wade makes his comment about someone being behind everything, Dashu says, whatever it is, it's watching and listening. Right after that, we hear Saul say, we don't know what they are. Maybe we can't know what they are. And when you add that all up, you can probably see where that's going without knowing anything else about the book series. Saul shares scenes with most of the characters, including a few with Will Downing, who's played by Alex Sharp. His description reads, a sixth form physics teacher, Will receives life-changing news that forces him to reconsider his place in the universe. This is the first description I read that I was like, wait a minute, I know who that is. That's the book character, Yun Tian Ming. This is another character who doesn't show up until the final book, but he's connected to Wade and Jin, and some of the scenes here look like things he's involved in, so I'd be really surprised if he doesn't turn out to be playing him. We don't see a lot of John Bradley's character Jack Rooney in this trailer. We just see him in the game. His character description reads, Rude, outspoken, and lovable, Jack used his physics degree to develop a snacks empire. While that doesn't tell us much, it does sound like the character Hu Wen, who was a friend of Tian Ming when they were in school. That covers the Oxford Five, Da Shi, Wade, and Raj. I mentioned that we see the younger and older versions of Ya Wen Zhe, and her description reads, Astrophysics prodigy Ya Wen Zhe feels alone in the universe after losing everything during the Chinese Cultural Revolution. A decision she made in the 1960s echoes through the centuries and may still be heard at the end of time. We also get our first good look at Jonathan Price, who's playing Mike Evans. His character description is short and sweet, describing him as a passionate environmentalist turned billionaire oil tycoon. He's connected to a character named Tatiana, who's played by Mario Kelly. Her description reads, raised from birth in Mike Evans' organization, Tatiana has dedicated her life to welcoming the outsiders by any means necessary. 
That pretty much covers all the characters in the official three-body trailer. One character I mentioned in the previous breakdown and who showed up when you put in the wrong password in the promo website they set up did get an official character description. Sofon is described as an avatar who appears in a mysterious VR game within the show. Overall, I think this trailer may have exceeded my expectations, and I was pretty excited about the series. It looks fantastic, and to circle back to what I opened with, the hook of this series for me was this really long ticking clock that you'll see develop as this mystery starts to reveal itself. Knowing something that will change everything is coming, and having that knowledge to sit with and contemplate for generations makes for a fascinating starting point. There are a lot of changes, but I think most of them make sense for a multi-season TV show. When asked about them, co-creator Alexander Wu said, The experience of watching a television series is different from watching a feature film, which is so different from the experience of reading a novel. What we're hoping to do is convey the experience, if not necessarily the exact details, of the novel onto the screen. What stayed, we hope, is the sense of wonderment and the sense of scope, of scale, where the problems are no longer just the problems of an individual, or even a nation, but of an entire species. Derek Sang, who says he read the series in Chinese and English before he signed on to direct episodes 1 and 2, added, The novel is written in Chinese, and it's mainly Chinese characters on the page. It makes sense that because we're adapting the story for our global audience, we've widened the scope and have more characters from all over the world. Author Sishin Liu gave us his blessing, and I think that David, Dan, and Alex did a great job in keeping what are essentially the best elements from the novel, while also making it into a much more global, international story. Nothing I see in this trailer contradicts that. I think the trick they need to pull off is making the characters they pulled forward feel like they should be there. I do believe it's a good idea, but it could come off feeling forced or their connections could seem a little too convenient if they're not handled with care. Eight episodes also seems a little short for the scope of everything that's included in this trailer, but I'd be happy to be proven wrong. I hope they're up to the challenge because I believe what I've been telling people, even people who couldn't get into the books. This has the potential to be a great TV series. If nothing else, the visuals look amazing and the tone of this trailer seems to be right. And that seems like a great place to leave things if you are really spoiler averse. In that case, Three Body will drop on Netflix on March 21st. If you want a little more of an idea of what's happening in this trailer from the creator's point of view rather than spoilers from the book, stick around. If not, this is your chance to leave. It's a little annoying to talk around the big events that set things in motion in this series, or even the broad strokes ideas on what it's about. But the way the trailer leans into the mysteries makes me think it would probably be fun to watch without any prior knowledge. If you're still here, you're not worried about that. So let's talk about this article that James Hibbard wrote for Hollywood Reporter that calls the show an alien invasion epic above the fold. Knowing that an invasion is coming is only the entry point, and what I liked about the story was the long-running ticking clock I mentioned earlier. To quote Hibbard, the aliens are not traveling at Star Trekian warp speed. It's going to take them 400 years to reach Earth. That one detail changes how humanity prepares. There are lifetimes to get ready, and as Benioff says, it is much less about fighting tentacle monsters and much more about how does humanity respond to this great existential threat. The rest of the article is worth reading. It's definitely the most I've seen from D&D since Game of Thrones ended, and the first time I've seen them talk about that experience. And they also talk about some of the things that happened in between, like their failed Star Wars project. In relation to Three Body, as a fan, I think they mostly say encouraging things. They address the obvious shift from being a Chinese story to a more Western perspective. This is something I brought up in my first book spoilers trailer breakdown, and I've kind of gotten used to the idea a little bit since then. They fall back to this notion that it was always the idea to do a global show, and that the rights holder, a gaming company called the Yuzu Group, wanted the Netflix version to be an English language adaptation. Alexander Wu says that despite it being a global show from the beginning, the Chineseness of the book's philosophy is preserved in some of the characters. He also mentions that they were able to adapt the scenes of the struggle sessions from the Cultural Revolution that the Chinese language version from Tencent left out. They also mentioned they had a meeting with the author of the series, Sishin Lu, who made it clear he was comfortable with making changes. 
Wu explained, the first thing he said was what a big fan of Thrones he was. He then said, I know you're going to have to make a lot of changes. We had Liu's blessing to adapt the show in the way we saw fit. While this is encouraging, it also kind of makes it sound like even though he has a producer credit, he wasn't all that involved in the making of this show. When they were planning things out, they expected it to take four seasons to tell the whole story. They said they considered the first book to be the weakest, which is something I would agree with, but it was still a little surprising to hear them say that about something they're adapting. But they said this added pressure to making the first season because they know they'll need a lot of people to watch to get another. It seems like it could explain some of the choices they made. And I should clarify that weakest here doesn't mean bad. As I've mentioned, I think the hook is there. But it picks up momentum from the beginning of the second book and doesn't let up until the end of the series. In an interview clip that's included with the article, they say there's an event in the second book that they feel is the point that if they can get to that, they'll be golden. In other words, the Red Wedding of this series. And anyone who's read the books knows exactly what they're talking about. Raman Jawadi comes up in that conversation as well, and they confirm that he'll be doing the score for Three Body, which is something I expected. The original music you hear on the Do Not Answer website sounds amazing, but I hadn't seen that confirmed anywhere else. The last bit of the article also serves as a relatively spoiler-free explanation of the beginning of the show's version of the story. Much of the show's first season follows a fractious group of physicists who come together under the leadership of a shadowy British intelligence chief as they spar against a murderous cult that wants to help the aliens colonize Earth. The spy chief is played by Liam Cunningham, who was Sir Davos Seaworth on Thrones, and the cult leader is played by Jonathan Price, who was the High Sparrow on Thrones. And this last quote from Benioff seems like a great place to leave things. It's hard to be idealistic and think we'd all come together if we had to. The aliens appeal to certain people who believe they're superior to us. And technologically, they are. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.